God's love is meteoric. His loyalty, astronomic. His purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse slips through the crack. How exquisite your love, O oh God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made, and he made man in his own image. May we never lose sight of his image. Our vision becomes blurred when we drift from the Word in a sea of distractions or thoughts that are stirred, or when we hear the whispers of a serpent. The serpent that slithers and lies behind pride, it hides and secretly divides us from the true vine. Sin is separation and separation is death. For God breathed life into us with his own breath. Our image has not been destroyed, but defaced within. Twisted and contorted by that thing we call sin. So now there's hesitation to be in relationship with he who created creation. But today there is celebration because of this demonstration of his love, our firm foundation. The love of this father for his child who so longed to be reconciled that he paid it all for which I am truly beguiled. All of this was in the word he spoke. The wine he spilled and the bread he broke, he exhaled, it is finished. And on the third day awoke and rose, breathing life into our hearts, blowing away the debris that pushed us apart. What art it was, his beautiful plan, bringing us back to him like the start of man before we defied his plan. Drowning in the darkness of sin unable to see who we are, let alone the image of he. His death tore the veil so that we may be able to behold him clearly. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Oh, death, where is your sting? For you are defeated by the one true king, whose face like snow and face as lightning, piercing through the darkness of what our sins did bring. So you see the truth behind the mystery that baffled many for a century, or was it two, maybe three? <laughs> From the times of Adam and Eve, when that bellowing voice said that the serpent's head would be bruised by her seed, the parallels of the life Moses led to the songs of David and the prophecies Isaiah read, all pointing to the blood he would shed. The holes in his hands meant that we would have a chance at life. Life afforded to us through a sacrifice. A perfect lamb slaughtered to atone. For six hours he hung alone so that we could have a place to call home. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. May we never lose sight of His image, for in His image there is identification. In His image there is reconciliation and liberation. And in His image there is life.
this morning. He is risen. Hey. Well, happy Easter. Welcome to the sanctuary. We're so glad that you're here. He is alive and he is here. <laughs> and so that means we have hope and we have life. And so we are here to honor him, to praise him, to thank him for what he has done. So God, we turn our eyes to you. God, with all of our heart, we're thankful. We're thankful. Come on, let's worship. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of life had given up his life The darkest day in history There on a cross they made for sin for every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake What sacrifice was made as the heavens roared? Come on, lift it up, church. We sing. All hail.
the response.
was more than enough. Hold the cross for you died. It was more than enough, Jesus. More than enough. Hold the cross for you died. The power of your blood was more. Just tell him. Just tell him. Say. on in your own way, would you just say thank you? Use your own words. Thank you that you did what was necessary for me to be healed and forgiven. Thank you for the price you paid. Thank you that you considered it joy to go to the cross because of what it meant for me. Thank you for bringing heaven to us when we couldn't get there ourselves. Come on, you tell him. Son of 
Come on up in the mezzanine. Come on, we're not spectators. Let's worship. Glory. I was thinking about all the times that, um, you know, life should have taken me out. When we were singing that, all the times that it felt like um, anxiety was never gonna let go. Um, all the times it felt like I didn't, you know, know whether or not I could get out of bed. All the times where it felt like, um, you know, I was in the middle of a war, in the middle of wrongs being done. And then we sing that line, but he went to the cross for me. And now I am free indeed. And that's what we can declare today. It doesn't matter what we feel. It doesn't matter what we face. Because he is risen. He came out of the grave. And he has defeated it all for us. And we can stand here and say, we're free. We're loved. We're whole. We have eternity to wait for. He is here and he is with us. So if you have been set free, would you begin to thank him with your praise for the freedom he bought for you? If he's delivered you, if he's seen you through, if he's provided for you, would you start to raise your praise? Come on up in the mezzanine, raise your praise for his love, for his glory. If he set you free, he deserves our praise. God. We <laughs> thank you, God. We thank you, God. All right, just thank him. You know, I feel like I don't have anything to thank God for. Yeah, you do. You got breath in your lungs. You're here. You're a child of God. Come on. It doesn't matter if you feel ashamed today. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're questioning today. Come on, would you just start to thank him for who he is, for what he's done? Thank you. How good is God? He's so good. Um, God knew you were coming today and he came ahead of you and he prepared everything that you needed. And so um, there's nothing to gain really by watching something today, but why would we watch something that people are doing when the King of glory is here with us? So if we're gonna watch something today, it's gonna be him. If we're gonna listen to something today, it's gonna be him, because he's here and uh, he's got what we need. And if you're like, I'm not even sure what that means, have an open heart, ask him to show up, and he will, because he's good and that's what he does. Amen. So, just sing a song that's been sung for a very long time want the room to sing it. Again, upstairs, don't watch. You know, God's here. Amazing
Come on, let's thank him for his love. All right, why don't you uh, turn to a couple people and tell them they look great in their Easter fit. And, uh, go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, man, it was, it's been a great morning. It's been amazing. The 9 a.m. was fantastic, and now we're here at the 11. I told this earlier, but uh, my kids, you know, coming up into Easter, I have a two-year-old. No, a three-year-old? A two-year-old. Three-year-old. He just turned three, okay? Give me a break. And a four-year-old. And uh, we've been telling Jesus comes back on Easter. He came back. It's amazing. And they ran into the church this morning. They went, where's Jesus? Where is he? Where is he? It's just a great morning. It's a great day to be here. And um, I, I want to make one quick announcement. If you happen to have up in the mezzanine down here anywhere, if you happen to have an empty seat next to you, would you just mind raising your hand? We are completely out of room. We are standing room only. So if you don't have a seat, we got people's hands raised. Come find them. Come sit in the seat. We got one right here up, up front, right here. Somebody come sit right here, right here. <laughs> I'll come sit right there. Listen, if this is your first time here, welcome. We love you. We honor you. You are part of our family. Scan the QR code. We just want to get to know a little bit about you, you know, just not weird things, just regular things. Reach out to you. Welcome you here, right? The only other announcement I have on this fine, fine Easter morning is that in just a little bit, we're going to be baptizing people, and I'm pumped. <laughs> I think in the 9 o'clock service, we baptized seven, eight, nine people somewhere in that range. Amazing, incredible. And the big thing that I want to tell you right now is whether you signed up, whether you didn't sign up, whether you scanned the QR code, whether you didn't, uh, if you want to get baptized, go over to that table right by the camera and sign up whenever we start baptizing. If you want to get baptized... We have everything you need. It doesn't matter if you signed up or not. We have towels. We've got shirts. We've got people. We're ready. Get baptized. Come out of the water as a new person here on Easter Sunday. You guys feeling good? All right. Jason, come on. Give it up for Taylor. Hey. So good. Yeah, we do have a couple seats down here, so if you need it. Um, and if you get up to go to the bathroom, someone's probably going to take your seat. But <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Can you make some noise for our online family this morning? I love you guys. I want to take a minute and encourage us around giving and generosity before we get into the word today. Um, yes, giving is powerful. Giving changes you. Giving changes you. Because in this world, we are conditioned to make life all about us. And that's why everything breaks. But when we realize that it's not about us, it's about something greater than us, that's when life starts to flow out of us. And when you start to give and prioritize giving and generosity, it changes your heart, changes your mind, it changes your relationships. I, I think it even changes your mental health. And ultimately, God responds to giving. Because when he sees people who are willing to give and trust him in giving, he blesses them. Because he realizes that you're not just... Um, you're not just a taker, but you're going to be a conduit for what God wants to do on the earth. So, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So as you trust God financially today, you know, you're investing here at the sanctuary. We exist to host places where people meet God. Yeah. And his presence is our priority. I don't think any one of us needs a church service today. But we don't need to go through the motions of a church service today when God shows up when we worship him. I don't need a church service. I need an encounter with God. I don't, I don't need a religious thing. I, I need Jesus in my life. I need to hear him. I need to let him transform me. I need him to work on me. I need to come close to Jesus. And so that's why we exist, to host places where people meet God and his presence is our priority. So as you give, I mean, you're making that possible for sure. But also as you give, you're changing the world. You know, we, we were able to, in February, we were able to give 
$8,600 to renovate an orphanage in Cambodia. Um, yeah, and then earlier in March, the first weekend of March, we were able to give over $9,000 to help battle the homelessness crisis in our city through the Light of Life Rescue Mission. And next week, we're gonna give more money away. But it depends, it depends on how much you give today. That's actually true. <laughs> it is true. And I'm pumped. So that's also a hook to come back next week, all right? <laughs> Good. Come on, let's pray um, as we give. Father, we honor you. We want to hear you speak to us today, God. We're here for you. Lord, transform us. God, make us like you. Make our hearts like your heart. God, the pieces of us that are... Um, that keep getting in the way, keep messing us up. God, change them today. <laughs> Fix us, save us, transform us. You know what is good because you are good. And so we yield to that. In Jesus' name. Best way to give is to scan the QR code on the screen or you can pass giving containers through the aisles. Um, there's also a box on the wall in the back. All right, fantastic. So for 2,000 years, there's been a greeting that Christians would share. They would say, he is risen. And then the person who hears it would respond, he is risen indeed. So he is risen. He is risen indeed. And the reason why they would do that was because in the early days of Christianity, if you believed that Jesus had been resurrected, they would come after you to kill you. I mean, you had multiple enemies right off the bat. If you said, I believe in Jesus, I believe that he's the way, I believe that he rose from the dead, they would, they would come after you to torture you, remove you from your family, take all of your possessions, and for many people, they would murder you. But you know, these people knew that Jesus had actually been killed, and they knew that the tomb was empty on Sunday morning, and they knew that Jesus was everything that they needed. And so they wouldn't back down no matter what the cost was. And so they had developed these little code words to share with each other because they weren't really sure when they would meet someone for the first time whether or not they were a believer. And one of the code words was this, he is risen. And if the person would respond, he is risen indeed, it's like, all right, you're not gonna kill me, we can be friends. <laughs> so that's where that came from. See, Christianity is not a philosophy. I mean, there's definitely philosophical implications, a way of understanding the world. Christianity is also not inherently some sort of moral code that we have to follow in order to please God. Although there are moral implications for sure, but, but it's not that at its core. And in fact, nothing about Christianity makes any sense whatsoever unless Jesus was dead and then alive three days later. See, because if you listen to the words that Jesus said, he was either a complete lunatic or he was the son of God. And if you actually pay attention to what he said and what the historical record proves that he said, there's no middle ground. And so if he died, he's just another Jewish rebel who was trying to get support against the corrupt political system. And let me tell you, there were a lot of them in his day, and a lot of them were killed. In fact, in 70 AD, just a couple decades after Jesus, man, the Romans were like, we're done with all these rebellions, and they came in in 70 AD and leveled the entire city of Jerusalem, destroyed it, because there were too many people trying to kick them out. And so if Jesus was just another guy who had interesting things to say, who got a following, who challenged the corrupt system of the day, if that's all he is, he's like one of hundreds. But if you actually listen to what he said, he didn't really say things that made sense unless he was the son of God. If the tomb was empty on Sunday morning, then everything he said was authoritative. If the tomb was empty there's something that we need to pay attention to about who he is and what he did. If it wasn't, Paul literally, like the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, Paul literally said, if he didn't raise from the dead, we are a bunch of fools to be pitied amongst all men. In other words, we're idiots. 
because none of this makes sense if he didn't rise from the dead. But if the grave was empty on Sunday morning, then not only did we have somebody to tell us how to make sense out of life, but we had even more what we actually needed. We had a savior, someone who could fix what was wrong with the very core of who we are. And, and I think we all know that there's something wrong with the core of who we are. We all know that. Like, we all know that we're crazy. Like, go on Facebook for three minutes. Everyone is crazy. <laughs> be married. Have kids. You will be convinced people are crazy. <laughs> Don't say amen if you're sitting next to your family. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> We know that there's something broken on the inside, and we also know that the only ways out are trying to fight harder to be better to fix it for ourselves. But we also know that no matter how hard we fight to try and fix it all, there are odds against us in this world that we don't really have the power to change. And there are things that we can't control, and at the end of the day, I am my own worst enemy. Who said that? Blink-182, or is that Green Day? <laughs> we know it. See, Ecclesiastes 3 says... He has planted eternity in the hearts of men. In other words, there's something inside of us that knows that there's supposed to be a purpose. We know that there's supposed to be meaning. We know that there's something bigger. In fact, we need purpose. We need meaning. And even if you don't believe in the resurrected Jesus, you still know that you need purpose in this life. But if there was no meaning, why would we want meaning? But we do. If this world is just happenstance, and there is no meaning to it, we wouldn't crave meaning. We wouldn't even know the difference because there was no meaning. But yet we crave meaning because there is a meaning, which means that something bigger than ourselves has to have meaning because I can't find it within me. There's a bigger meaning. And we have this really strange thing that we have adopted as a society. We, we have this idea that Every person ought to be completely independent and autonomous in what they think and what they believe. Well, we have this idea that I can decide who I am, I can decide what matters to me, and I can decide what's true for me. And we will fight to defend that to the core. I know who I am, I've discovered who I am, I've discovered it within myself, I know. The problem is, if we all adopt that way of thinking, it doesn't work. Because what's right for me is inevitably gonna brush up against what's right for you. And if those two things are in conflict and your right hurts my right, well, someone's gotta decide who is actually right. Or else we're all gonna kill each other. Which is why our society today is as broken and divided and angry and hostile as it is. Because everyone's fighting over what's right and everyone's fighting for their right to determine what is right. As if there's no higher power that decides right. But it doesn't work. And you know it doesn't work. You, you could be self-indulgent. You could get everything you want out of life and end up an addict who hurts everyone in the process. You could get everything you want out of life and end up with a string of broken relationships behind you because every relationship that you approached was looking for someone to meet your needs. You could live your entire life trying to build the kind of life that you want the most and never find it because this world can't give it. And there's this crazy man who said that there was a way back to our creator, a way back to the one who formed us in the first place, a way back to the one who imagined us each uniquely into existence. There was a way back to him, but it wasn't through trying or striving or performing or earning or deserving. It wasn't through religion. It wasn't through moral codes. It wasn't through philosophical understanding. It was through grace. 
that we could come back, not to a philosophy, but come back to a relationship because we were made for love. We were made for intimacy. We were made for relationship. And there's this crazy man who came and said, there's a way back. And here's how. Your sin has to be defeated and you have to be born brand new. Born, reborn to the way you were created to be in the first place. And everyone looked at him and said, that's insane. We don't even know what that means. And he said, just wait. And that leads us to this man who did nothing but good, dying on a Roman cross and his followers are confused out of their minds. John chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, Jesus was crucified on a Friday afternoon. He was dead. Mary was there. She knew he was dead. John was there. He knew he was dead. They saw blood and water flow out of his side, meaning it was flowing out of his broken heart and out of his rib cage. He was dead. They saw it. They knew it. But according to Jewish religious customs, they couldn't do much about it because Saturday from sundown Friday to sundown the following day, it was the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to do anything. Plus, this was a high holy Sabbath because it was Passover. And so they quickly get his body off the cross. They embalm the body place it in a grave nearby because they didn't have time to go through the proper ritual. So on Saturday, they sit there, not allowed to do anything by law. So when the sun rises early on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, Mary gets up first thing because this is the first time she's allowed to go properly take care of the body. That's why she's there. And so she goes and she gets there and to her horror, the stone that was closing the tomb was gone. It had been rolled away. The, like it was open. And Mary's first thought was not, he's alive. No, her first thought was, they're messing with his body. They're killing him, and now they're gonna do something even worse, and they're gonna defile his body. She is heartbroken. And so she runs back to find Peter and John, who were Jesus' closest disciples, and she said, the body's gone. And it says, Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, because... John wrote this, I'm serious, and that's what he called himself in his, I'm serious. This story was written by four different people, all based on eyewitness accounts. John was based on his own eyewitness accounts, and they didn't collaborate, which is why we know that there's historical accuracy behind this story. In fact, and I'm not going to go into it today, If you were to truly, honestly look at the historical and scientific evidence of the last 2,000 years, there would only be one honest conclusion that you could come to if you only researched historicity. And the conclusion would be, Jesus was dead and then he was alive. And if you want resources to find that out, we'll point you in the right direction. It's undeniable that this happened. So, Peter and John run for the tomb But the other disciple, John's talking about himself in third person, outran Peter, and he reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in it and saw that there were strips of linen, which means that John looks in there and he's like, they didn't take the body. Because if they took the body, they wouldn't have unwrapped it first. And so he's super confused. And then Simon Peter comes along behind him and goes straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there as well. So in other words, John's like, I'm not making this up. Like, ask Pete. He also saw it. They were there. And the cloth that had been wrapped around his head, the cloth was laying in its place separate from the linen. And so you have three people who are at the tomb. You've got Mary, you've got Peter, you've got John. They're all there, and they're all trying to figure out what was going on. But all three of them are coming to this moment with a very different perspective and a different mentality. Because John, man, John was close with Jesus. John was the only one of the 12 disciples 
to stick with Jesus when he was on the cross. He was the only one there. All the other disciples scattered, but John stayed because John, who knew that he was loved by Jesus, was not motivated by obligation and he wasn't ruled by fear. He was ruled by love. And love always outruns curiosity, which is why when we're up here singing and praising and it gets a little wild and people are like, why are they acting this way? Like, it's love and it is crazy and it ought to be crazy. John outran because he was loved. He knew he was loved. But John, I mean, he's also confused. How could this man have been killed? So he knows he's loved, but he's confused because Jesus, who he thought was the savior, Jesus, who he thought was the answer, is now dead. And John runs with his confusion. Mary comes from a different angle. Mary, man, her life had been changed by Jesus. She followed Jesus just like the disciples did, along with a couple other women. And Mary, the only thing we really know about Mary's story is that we are told that when Mary first met Jesus, that Mary was filled with seven demons. Now, seven in Jewish thinking could mean that literally there were seven spirits that were like ruling her that were like, you know, had the run of the house. But seven also means completeness. And so it's possible that what that means is that she was just completely taken over by the dark side. Like she was a mess. We think she was probably a prostitute. We don't really know the whole story, but she was a mess. But what happened when she met Jesus is that Jesus set her free. See, she had been messed up, broken, dysfunctional, but one encounter with Jesus had freed her and she realized that the real Mary wasn't the Mary who was oppressed by the darkness. The real Mary was the one who was created by the Father and loved by God. She was free. She owed everything to Jesus. And so she had all this hope for what life could be, but now the one who freed her is gone. I think Mary's just devastated. She had all of her hope in one thing. It feels like it was ripped away from her. And then you got Peter. And Peter's coming from a different story. I mean, Peter's, Peter's in a tough spot. Because Peter, literally at dinner on Thursday night, sat across the table and said literally to Jesus, I will never leave you. And then Jesus gets arrested. And a couple hours later, Pete's like hanging back, trying to figure out what's going on. And this girl comes up to him and says, I recognize you. You're one of Jesus' disciples. You're with him. And Pete says, I am not. I don't even know the man. This happens three times that night. Peter has denied Jesus three times. Peter didn't run as fast as John because he was carrying a burden of his own guilt and shame. You got three people at the tomb at the same time. And you know what the truth is? I relate to every single one of those things. Confused? Yeah. Life is confusing. It doesn't always work out the way we want it to. Where is God? What's he doing? Why is this happening? Why did that person treat me that way? Why did I end up where I ended up? This doesn't make sense if God is good. Also, I feel Mary's devastation. My whole life just broke apart. I, all the things I thought were gonna happen aren't happening now, and I don't know what to do with the broken pieces. I mean, I never thought that I'd be a single dad raising kids on my own. Why, why is this happening? Why am I here? And then you got Peter, who's just got this shame. Oh, we all relate to that, right? We've all screwed up. We've all made mistakes. We all haven't been good enough, haven't done the right things. And they all come. John, the one motivated by love but confused, steps inside after Peter comes out. And he saw the empty tomb and he was the first one to say, oh, I know what happened. He's alive. He 
conquered death. He conquered sin. He's more powerful than all of it. And he knew, first one to know. Why? Because he knew that he was loved. That's why he could see what God was doing. When you know that you're the one that he loves, you know who you were made to be. See, we know that our father created us and he created us with a good design. He created all of humanity and it was good. And God, when he created us, we are told very specifically in the beginning pages of the scriptures, we're told very specifically that God didn't make us haphazardly like he made other animals and other inanimate objects. We are not on the same level. He didn't make us like that. He made us differently than everything else. And do you know what the thing is that makes us different? We were made in his image. In other words, there's the nature of God that he imparted into us. When he created us, we were carrying a reflection of who God is and what he is like. We were made in his image. And the truth is, is that you will never know who you really are until you know what your father says you are. Because he created you, he fashioned you, he formed you. And to know God is the only way to know who you really are. You can't find it in yourself because you're not your own creator. You didn't design you. You didn't come up with you. You didn't manufacture you. You didn't create you. You're not the artist who put you together. But there is an artist who puts you together. There is a father who birthed you and designed you. There is a master who created a masterpiece, and it is you. But until you know who he is and what he says about you, you'll never know who you are. And so John, he knew that he was loved, which is why he was able to say, I know what God is up to because I've heard his voice, I've seen his face, and I know his power. Now they leave and Mary, I don't think John tells anyone what the conclusion is that he's come to because Mary is there, Peter goes back, they, they're trying to figure things out. And, and Mary on her own stays there and it says that she stood outside of the tomb crying and and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And when she went in there, she saw two angels in white seated where the body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And the angel said to her, why are you crying? And she says, they've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was him. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. And what's so interesting is that Mary knew Jesus, but in this moment, Mary couldn't recognize Jesus. And do you know why? Because she was looking through a lens of all of her hurts and all of her loss. And she's not looking at God clearly because she's only looking at God through the lens of how hard life has been. And for some of you, you can't see God clearly and you can't see what he says about you because you look at him through the lens of all of the stuff that went wrong in your life. All the people that mistreated you, all the ways that you've screwed up, all the ways that things didn't work out the way that you wanted them to. And you can't see him as a loving father because you can't recognize him when he shows up as a loving father because you don't believe that he is a loving father because this world has taught you, taught you to believe that he isn't. And we see him through our loss and we can't recognize him. But then Jesus says one word to her and it changes everything. He says Mary, and when she hears Jesus call her by name, she becomes alive, and she sees him for who he really is, and she falls toward him and says the name that she's always called him. I don't know what lens you're looking through today. I know that I've spent my days looking through a lens of devastation. I know that I've spent my days looking through a lens of shame. 
I know I've spent my days looking through a lens of confusion. confusion. But what I wanna tell you is that no matter what you're looking through today, the tomb is empty and he's standing right here in front of you. And he's looking at you and he's calling your name. And he's saying, you are the one I love. But I can't know who I really am until I know who God really is. And the reason why the tomb is empty is because he wants to be present with you to show you who he is. Because when you see him in his glory, in his power, in his beauty, in his majesty, it all makes sense. You're the one that created it. You're the one that knows how it works. And you created it out of love. And I am your son, the one you love. But a lot of us aren't at peace with ourselves because we don't know our creator and we don't know who he created us to be. But he's here showing us who he is if we will look at him. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter three, it says that when we look at God, we turn to God and the veil between us and God is removed. What that means is that the barrier between us and God was removed when Jesus died on the cross. His blood paid for our sin and there is now no gap between us and God. And so when we look at God, we're not looking through a lens. We're not looking through a veil. We're not looking through a barrier because God has made himself known to us. And so it says, when we turn to face God, God removes the veil, and here we are, face to face with him. Suddenly, we are able to recognize that God is living. He's personal. He's present. He's not some philosophy or moral code. He's a person. He's a father. He's a lover, and he's alive. And when God is personally present, a living spirit that old constricting legislation is obsolete. In other words, our past, our failures, our confusion, our devastation, it evaporates when we see him for who he really is. Because when we see him in his grace, in his love, in his resurrection power, we're free. Nothing between us and God, and our faces shine with the brightness of his face. We are restored back to his image. And so we are transfigured or transformed like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. <laughs> we can see him. And when we see him, we can see who we are. Three things that God wants to tell you today. First, Jesus wants you to know that he loves you with the most costly love. You are the one he loves. Second, Jesus wants you to hear him calling you by name. It's personal. Mary! When I hear you call my name, I'm free to be who you made me to be. And that is real freedom. And third, Jesus wants to free you from your dysfunction so that you can be who you were made to be. John knew that he was the beloved. Mary heard her name and she came back to life. Peter had a little bit more complicated of a story. Peter was carrying all that guilt and shame around, you know? And Peter actually sees Jesus alive later on that day. But then even after that, he goes back to his old life. He goes back to fishing. And Jesus goes out of his way to meet Peter on the shore of the lake where he was fishing. And Jesus doesn't come to yell at him for denying him or scold him or condemn him. No, Jesus sits down on the beach and makes him breakfast. He's a good savior. <laughs> and Peter comes up and he's like, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and he says, 
Simon, do you love me? Which is weird because when Jesus first met Peter, his name was Simon. But Peter renamed him, or sorry, Jesus renamed him to be Peter. And when Jesus renamed him to be Peter, Jesus told him that he had a calling, that he had a purpose from heaven to fulfill in this life. That, that he was supposed to advance the mission of God and he was not a fisher of of fish anymore. He was meant to be a fisher of men. There was this whole purpose and calling that was attached to it. But Jesus looks at him and he says, Simon. And I'm like, why are you calling him Simon? I'm like, oh, because that's who Peter thinks he is. He thinks he's still the dysfunctional guy who's disqualified himself from Jesus's love. That's who he believes he is. And so Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? He's like, yeah, you know I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my lambs. And you're like, what's that mean? It means get on with the purpose that I gave you. You're meant to lead. You're meant to care. You're meant to change the world. I've got a calling on you. And Peter's over here thinking, I can't do it because I've screwed up too much. But Jesus says, get on with it. And then a second time, Jesus says, Simon, do you love me? He's like, yeah. Then get on with the calling I gave you. And then a third time, Jesus says, do you love me? And the moment that Jesus asked a third time, Peter's heart sunk because he realized that Jesus was doing that because Peter had denied him three times. And Jesus looks at Peter in the place of his sin, the place of his dysfunction, the place of his betrayal, the place of all of the garbage and shame and condemnation that Peter's carrying. And Jesus says, I'm gonna get right in there with you. And I'm gonna free you from that. See, Peter carried that shame and guilt that we carry. And the resurrected Jesus didn't meet him with condemnation. He met him with grace. And so if you're confused today, he wants you to know he loves you. If you're devastated today, he wants you to hear him call you by name. And if you feel guilty and ashamed today, Jesus is not ignoring your sin. He's gonna meet you right in the place of your sin, not to judge you, but to free you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. All of this comes from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting our sins against us. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. And I wanna tell you that the power of the resurrection is not reserved for the, the textbooks of history, but the power of the resurrection is here and it is available to you today. That the resurrected Jesus can birth the resurrection in you. It was his resurrection, but it's also our resurrection because we are able to be resurrected out of our sin, resurrected out of our dysfunction, resurrected out of our devastation, resurrected out of our confusion, resurrected to the real me, the real you, the one who is loved, the one who the Father calls by name, the one who the Father frees and gives grace, and his resurrection is our resurrection. So today, if anyone is in Christ, our dysfunctional identity is buried in the grave, and that is not coming out. The power of sin is buried in the grave. Our old relationship with the world World. It's buried in the grave. Our own dysfunctional thoughts buried in the grave. Our own devastation and sin, it's buried in the grave. And the power of evil over you is buried in the grave. The power of Satan is buried in the grave. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. His resurrection is our resurrection. So, what do you need to leave in the grave today? Some of you need to leave some beliefs in the grave. You don't believe you're the loved of God, you believe you're depressed. 
I'm not saying you don't feel depressed. I'm saying you think that's who you are. But the empty grave says a different word about you. Some of you think you're a product of all your sins and mistake, but the empty grave says a different word about you. It says you're a child of grace. Some of you think that it's up to you to figure yourself out, and that's why you're screwed up. And it's time to leave that in the grave and say, I don't define me, you define me. I don't make myself, you made me. And in that surrender and submission, there is liberation. Let's close our eyes for a minute. Come on, everyone in the mezzanine. Close your eyes. I know there's some of you out there who can't really see. It doesn't matter, God sees you, even if I can't. What do you need to leave in the grave? Just tell him, hey, I'm leaving it. I'm leaving it here. I'm leaving it here. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's some people with real fear living in your heart right now. Like you're afraid because you think it's all on you and you're not sure you're gonna be good enough. And, and right now, God is freeing you from that fear if you'll hand it over to him. I think some of you um, have defined yourself by a diagnosis. And I think right now, God is setting you free from that. He's saying that diagnosis doesn't define you. I define you. My love defines you. My resurrection defines you. My grace defines you. Some of you... Um, yeah. You just need to let it go. Say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. Close your eyes. If, you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord, if, you nev if you've never made Jesus your Lord, in other words, you've never said, I need your grace, I need your forgiveness, hey, he loves you. He's not gonna come in your life unless you invite him. And he's not gonna forgive you unless you ask him to because he doesn't want a robot, he wants a relationship. So he's waiting for your yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you're like, I need to start a relationship with God, I need to accept his grace today. I need to accept his forgiveness. I want him in my life. On the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to slip up your hand. We're not gonna do anything weird and call you out or force you to do anything. We're just gonna pray together. But I want you to acknowledge this moment because this is when the old you dies and the new you, the real you, the true you comes alive by the power of his grace. With our eyes closed, if you need Jesus. One, two, three. Yeah, come on, who else? Up in the mez? Yeah, come on, who else? Way up in the back, I see your hand. Way over on the side, I see it. Yeah, in the back here, awesome. We're gonna pray. Um, we're a big family, so let's all pray together. Pray out loud after me. Dear Jesus, I'm coming home. I need you. I need your grace. I need your love. I need your forgiveness. As of today, I'm a child of God, forever forgiven, forever loved. Make me who you made me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Yeah, come on, let's celebrate with the people who made that choice. All right, if you raise your hand, two things. One, stop by the welcome desk. We'd love to put a Bible in your hands. It's our gift to you. And number two, keep coming back. God's got good things in store for you. Um, we're gonna baptize some people. You go under the water, it represents the old you dying there. The dysfunctional you, the sin controlled you, it dies. You come up out of the water, it represents the real you is alive. The resurrection of power of Jesus Christ has brought you back to life. Some of you came prepared to be baptized, but some of you are here and you need to be baptized, but you didn't come prepared to be baptized. I wanna dare you on Easter Sunday to get in the water and go public with your relationship with God. Come on. Come on, if that's you, go to the table right there. We'll sign you up. We have shorts, we have t-shirts, we have blow dryers, whatever you need. Come on, who needs to get baptized? Let's make some noise for the people as they're moving. Yeah. Awesome. Now we're gonna stand to our feet and we're gonna worship as we baptize people. Come on, Lord, we love you. We honor you, we praise you, we magnify you. Hallelujah.
Come on, Beyonce, would you lead us? Let's worship.
Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name, it stands above them all. Declare this, come on. Your name is the highest. Your name. It's the greatest, your name, it stands above them all. All thrones and positions, all power and position. Your name, it stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cry.
Come on, can we give it up for an awesome God? Um, there, there are still quite a few people in line <laughs> waiting to get baptized. And um, so listen, you still have a chance if you need to make this decision. Come on, let's go do it. Stop at the table. Also, you know, wanna let you know, I know people have like lunch plans and brunch plans and whatever else. We're just gonna keep worshiping. We're gonna keep baptizing people as long as we need to. And you know, you have, you know, our blessing to head into your week with the love of God and the grace of God going with you. But we're gonna, we're gonna just keep, we got 10 more people. <laughs> Come on, come on, let's give it up for God. Yeah. And if some of you guys up there wanna come on down, there's some space down here if you wanna look at it from a better angle, but it's up to you guys.
regardless of our situation, regardless of the valleys or the mountains, we're all, we're gonna continue to give him praise. We're going to thank our God. We said thank you, God, for sending. you. 
The Lord is keeping you. The Lord is turning his face towards you. The Lord is smiling at you. And the Lord is giving you peace. He is risen. I love you guys. Um, come back next week, 10, 15, and 6. Love you so much. Happy Easter. Fashioned us from the dust. And since our existence, there's only been one mission for you to commune with us. And then came the garden, we became the fallen. Sin made us lose our way. Oh, but the love that's too good to give up set a course for amazing grace. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Tell everybody how he saved you.